carry on. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be at this conference. It's a pleasure to be able to to speak and to share some some thoughts that I have on sustainability from the perspective of engineering. I'm an engineer, so this is something that's very near and dear to me. The title of my talk, as, as stated, is Sustainable Engineering, a Central Driver for Sustainability. I'm a past president of the Engineering Institute of Canada, which is an umbrella organization that has as its members all the learned societies in engineering in Canada. The presidents are members of the board, for instance. And I'm a professor of engineering at University of Ontario Institute of Technology in Oshawa, near Toronto, in Canada although we've just changed our name now to Ontario Tech University, a little shorter. I'll give you a bit of an overview of where I'm going with my talk today. Uh, a brief introduction is where I'll start. Uh, then I'll talk generally about sustainability, a very broad concept with many interpretations and many viewpoints. I'll then narrow into engineering sustainability in the third part of my talk. And finally, I'll give some examples of engineering sustainability to hopefully illustrate and, and bring to life some of the material a little more, and then I'll close. The motivation for my talk, a very, very simple. Uh, shown at the bottom here, sustainability. I believe sustainability is incredibly important. It's a, a vital concern for humanity and civilization. We have to find a way to live the way we'd like now, but to do so in the future and to allow future generations to be able to do that. Engineering plays a huge role in society in providing so many features, so many benefits so many aspects of society and civilization that we, we really can't do without it. For overall sustainability, we need engineering, therefore, to be sustainable. It's part of our life uh, to do engineering sustainably helps us a lot. I show this diagram on a backdrop of Toronto, the city I'm speaking from. Time-wise, that's about right. It's sunrise right now here. Uh, and I'll illustrate, uh, this is a city, almost eight, uh, seven and a half million people in the greater Toronto area. Uh, making this sust uh, city sustainable is important. Uh, we have lighting, we have heating of buildings, we have transportation to move around. We have industrial centers along the lake here, further outside the city. All of that has to be sustainable to truly achieve sustainability, and that means engineering has to contribute. The scope of the talk is, is global. So much of engineering uh, is global in extent. It's, it's done worldwide, but the resources we draw from for engineering are often regional like a mine, but global if you think of, of resources that we exchange and trade among countries. Wastes can be very local but waste can be global in nature too, like carbon dioxide emissions get into the atmosphere, circulate around, and contributions from one country are shared globally, contributing to greenhouse effect and, and climate change problems. Uh, sustainability in general, I'd like to focus on right now for a little bit. Uh, it's a broad topic, as I mentioned. It's a topic that has an awful lot of interpretations. One way of looking at it, and this is a fairly common viewpoint, is to look at sustainability as a three-way Venn diagram, as shown here, or to look at sustainability as landing or relying on three pillars, a social sustainability pillar, an environmental sustainability pillar, and an economic sustainability pillar. In the Venn diagram form shown here, the idea is that there's a tension between environment, economic, and social sustainability at times, or at least there's not complete overlap. You can focus on environmental uh, sustainability, but not necessarily worry about economics, therefore protecting the environment wonderfully and harming the economy to the point where people's lives are actually negatively affected. 
or you can focus on economic, uh, economic um, sustainability, make sure things are affordable by people, all people in the world, all their, their needs are met, but you may cause damage to the environment in doing so and keeping everything affordable. Uh, you may have social problems if you do things that are not acceptably socially. People will not achieve social sustainability. Cultures may not be allowed to develop or people will not be happy with the state that you've created. The idea overall then is to achieve true sustainability. We need to find the intersection of both environment, of all of environmental, economic and social sustainability, this gray area in the middle. I won't talk about the two-way intersections. You get close, but not quite there. Uh, sustainability is multidisciplinary, incredibly multidisciplinary. Uh, I learn this more and more every day. I'm editor-in-chief of a journal called Sustainability. This is our logo. It's an international open access journal. It's grown, I've been editor-in-chief for a decade now, the founding editor, and it's grown immensely. Now we get hundreds of pages per, per issue on a monthly, hundreds of papers per issue on a monthly basis. It's, it's incredibly broad. We have many sections. Virtually every discipline seems to have a stake in sustainability. We get papers from, of course, environmentalists, but we also get papers from biologists and chemists. We get papers from all sorts of engineers, civil engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers. But then we go beyond economists, finance people, submit papers about economic sustainability. On the social sciences, we get papers from uh, philosophers, from geographers. We get papers from, from lawyers about laws related to sustainability. It's, the breadth of topics that fall into sustainability make it an incredibly multidisciplinary field. And that makes it a very challenging area because it's very hard for one person in one discipline to lead us to sustainability. Uh, the importance I want to emphasize, it, it's big, and the importance in engineering is very big too. And I think I can emphasize it with this slide. Uh, this is uh, the vision statement of the Engineering Institute of Canada. I'm a past president of that organization, which has been around since 1887. And in that visioning exercise, we came up with beyond the longer text, a very short, simple, concise statement, engineering for a prosperous, safe and sustainable Canada. And this highlighting of sustainable is my emphasis. The key point here is we were looking at, and this was not just for Canada alone, but for Canada and Canada to exchange with the world technology and, and methods that it develops. But I point out here that of the three adjectives, prosperous, safe, sustainable made it in as one. So engineering is viewing sustainability as something very important and as something that it has to contribute to. This was not our vision statement previously. So sustainable is something that's working its way more and more into the fore. Let me focus on after that segue into engineering sustainability a little more. Um, sustainability is a broad topic. Um, sustainable development can be defined by the Brundtland def, uh, Commission definition of the 1980s, which is something like a, um, development that allows present generations to meet their needs while not hindering future generations and their ability to meet their needs. But how do you find a definition of engineering sustainability? I couldn't find something as as simple as commonly accepted. In fact, I couldn't find a definition at all. So I had a question. What is engineering sustainability? Tried the Oxford English Dictionary, tried Webster's, looked on the internet, had trouble finding a good, widely accepted definition. So I played around on my own. I simply said, to me, it's the provision of engineering services in a sustainable manner. It's not engineering that people are after, it's the services that we deliver through engineering. People want 
the rooms to be lit, the buildings to be warm or cool, but comfortable nonetheless and healthy. People want their vehicles to move them from point A to point B. They don't care about necessarily it being a car or another type of vehicle. It's getting from point A to point B. That's the key item, except for aficionados who love their cars, but that's a separate matter. And I presented this definition at some conferences and everything was fine until one day uh, there was a linguist in the audience who called me out and took me to task on it saying, no, 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 you cannot define engineering sustainability and use the word sustainable in that definition. It's a circular definition. It means virtually nothing. So I had to go further. So what do I mean by sustainable manner? I have to amp amplify on that, at least in a manner that allows uh, the necessities to be met by people, all the engineering provision uh, to meet the necessities of people throughout the world, even in the poorest countries, uh, that engineering services are affordable and not restricted to only those wealthy enough to pay, that engineering services are provided in an environmentally benign manner. The environment is a shared public trust. We draw from it resources, we dump into it wastes, and if we do so, non-carefully, in a careless manner, we get problems. And finally, acceptable. Uh, the provision of engineering services in a sustainable manner includes it being acceptable to the populations where it will be placed. If it's not acceptable, you can run into problems. Try putting a nuclear power plant into a, a country that has a very strong anti-nuclear bent to it. And I'm not saying nuclear is bad or good, I particular, on my own, I think it's a very useful technology and we have a lot of it in Ontario in my province. But the point I want to make is it has to be acceptable to people. If people in Ontario, people buy into nuclear, they see benefits to it in other countries. Uh, you get the opposite effect. If you try pushing engineering solutions that you think are sustainably technic sustainable technically on people who don't agree, you probably don't have an acceptable situation. You will not achieve sustainability in the long run. People will push back and people will push back for a long time pretty strongly. Okay, so there's my definition of engineering sustainability. Let me take that definition and expand to requirements. What do I think the requirements are for engineering sustainability? Well, I'll start with the first one and I have five main ones I'm going to list here. The first one, sustainable resources. We have to use resources that are sustainable or use resources in as sustainable manner as we can. And by resources, everything. I mean, energy resources, water shown in the diagram, uh, fresh water or salted water. Uh, materials, materials that are replenishable like wood, as well as finite materials that we have in certain quantities on the planet and we have to make do with that. Uh, metals might be a case in point and on and on and on the list goes. We have, we use resources in engineering, we need to do so with sustainable resources as much as possible. If we rely on finite resources and eventually they're used up or used to the point where they're no longer functional for us, we've exhausted them. If we really have a need for them, we have a non-sustainable future. Uh, I can expand on some of these resources on the right side here, solar uh, cell, solar collectors, ground mount solar collectors, a way of getting energy that doesn't use the finite fossil fuels in the ground, but rather relies on the virtually infinitely replenishable solar energy streaming from the sun. The sun will last, they say, about 3 billion years longer before it goes supernova. So we have quite a sustainable resource there. Uh, on the left, wood resources. These are oil palms. They can be used for actually energy production for uh, biofuels in the form of oil. But of course, wood can be used in other ways. The second main requirement for engineering sustainability I'll talk about is appropriate processes. We start with sustainable resources, great. We also need to have processes that use those resources appropriately so as not to cause unsustainable situations. 
So we can use processes that facilitate sustainability. For instance, processes that work off sustainable resources through modification rather than processes that require that, that work off the non-sustainable resources that they might have used in the past. As well, processes that are cyclic rather than linear cyclic, meaning we use and reuse and reuse and recycle things over and over rather than once through we use it and we discard it tends to be more uh, sustainable. And substitution of sustainable options. Processes that allow us to replace existing technologies with more sustainable options. Um, electricity shown on the left is one energy form that allows us to tap into energy forms that are renewable, nuclear, as well as fossil fuel. It's just a carrier. We don't use energy. Electricity isn't a source of energy. It's a carrier and it allows us to tap into a broad array. Uh, this is a hydrogen vehicle. Hydrogen is a fuel that can also allow us to tap into a broad array of, of energy forms. In addition, it's a type of technology that's a substitute. It's a vehicle that will run on hydrogen. Hydrogen can be produced from renewable energy forms, not necessarily a need for a vehicle to run on fossil fuels. That allows us to substitute vehicles with sustainable options, electrical vehicles, would fall into that category too. Okay, so with sustainable resources, appropriate processes to utilize that sustainable aspect of the resources. The third requirement for sustainability, engineering sustainability is efficiency, increased efficiency. Uh, every device has an efficiency and making it more efficient in itself does not make things sustainable. If it's using a finite resource and it's more efficient, it will be a longer time before we have none of the resource left and we have to switch to a different technology, but it buys us time and it uses less resources along the way, uses, it produces less waste typically along the way. And I mean efficiency in a very holistic sense here. When I say holistic, I mean device efficiency, like the efficiency of a pump or a turbine, but even broader efficiency of a system like a power plant that uses pumps and turbines and many other devices, as well as a good resource management so that we take advantage of resources and use them efficiently. Oh, sorry, back with resource management, we can take advantage of supply and demand and match supplies to demands when they're there and use storage where necessary to store resources that Aren't, necess aren't necessarily needed at a given time until they are needed. Uh, matching end use, uh, matching supply and end use as well as kind of like supply and demand, but also can be uh, in heating processes. If we need heating in a building at 21 degrees centigrade, do we really need to use natural gas, which can, when combusted, produce 800 degrees centigrade heat? Can we tap into lower temperature heat sources and leave the high temperature producing natural gas for specialty areas like industrial per processes where it's needed? Can we use low temperature solar collectors or low temperature waste heat from industry or geothermal energy that is available at low temperatures to match the supply quality to the end use? Uh, good integration of processes allows us, for instance, to take processes where wastes would normally be discarded, but if those wastes can be used by another company, tap in and make sure the wastes go to offset the need for fresh resources by that second company. Can increase efficiency there. And even the design of systems to facilitate efficiency. You can design systems to be more efficient. You can design broad macro system cities to be more efficient. You can align transport corridors where between where people and live and where people work to make sure people get there uh, easily. You can, instead of having urban sprawl and spreading cities out, you can concentrate more and keep people where they live in areas where they work in others. You don't need as many transport corridors. You don't use as much space. You can leave more space in a pristine natural form, which biological species, animals, uh, find are easier, easier to thrive in.
So many aspects of efficiency. Uh, there are advanced tools for efficiency. Exergy analysis is one I've done work in for, for decades. It's like energy analysis, but it's different. It looks at energy quality. It's a non-conserved quantity, unlike energy. So it, quality is not something that's conserved, even if energy technically is. And it allows us to get much more meaningful understanding of efficiencies, efficiencies that truly measure what we think we're measuring in common sense terms, using intuition. Energy efficiencies are sometimes quite misleading. Uh, it tells us where true losses are occurring and therefore where we have improvement potential to do better. We can apply exergy analysis to any device, a pump, a power plant, even the planet. We can look at the planet as something where you have an input of energy, solar energy, and an output, basically heat, at radiated away at the temperature of the Earth. So that'd be thermal energy, which has low exergy uh, correspondingly, and that the amount of energy that leaves the Earth is roughly equal to what comes in from the sun. If it didn't, the Earth would be heating up really quickly. Now, climate change is causing, a, a global warming is causing a slight heating due to changing the atmosphere concentration of CO2 and other greenhouse gases. But for the most part, all the solar energy coming in leaves as low temperature thermal energy emission. So if the energy balance is well, what drives the earth? Well, it's a quality. We use a high quality, we reject low quality, uh, and that allows us to do things like photosynthesis and ocean circulation patterns, atmospheric patterns, and that drives the earth. Okay, I don't have time to dwell on exergy too much, although I'd love to. Uh, let me move on though to the fourth requirement for engineering sustainability in my mind, and that is uh, reduced environmental impacts. If we, excuse me, if we reduce environmental impacts, we go a long way towards that environmental pillar of sustainability. Um, many aspects of environment, we draw resources from the environment, we deposit waste into the environment, we have to deal with both of those. Tools like life cycle assessment shown on the left, abbreviated LCA, can help us a lot because instead of just looking at a snapshot of how something's operating, like a car, we look at the full life cycle from the production of the vehicle to the fueling of it and the production of the fuels to the operation of it over say its lifetime of 10 years to the recycling if there is any recycling of parts or reuse if it's resold to another user and final ultimate disposal into the environment to get the full understanding of the environmental impact in the middle here is a thermogram of the earth showing temperatures we have a global uh, rise temperatures have risen since say 1950 by about 1 1.1 1 .1 degree attributed to global warming and therefore climate change effects we need to be aware and deal with that and ccs carbon capture and sequestration this is the dream and the hope of the fossil fuel industry that we can capture carbon before it leaves power plants automobiles and other uh, fossil fuel burning devices and be captured and stored the S is sequestered or stored, uh, but maybe turning it into a rock, maybe storing it in old caverns, maybe storing it in other ways. Regardless, environmental impact is important and sustainability without reducing environmental impact to manageable levels doesn't mean we have sustainability. Uh, the other, the fifth requirement that I want to dwell on is satisfying other facets for sustainability. Um, the first four you'll notice are pretty technical. And being an engineer, I think my background is to approach sustainable engineering from a technical viewpoint. But there are many non-technical and other facets that we need to deal with. And some of those are shown on this slide. There are many. We need to, let me start somewhere here, attitudes. We need to affect people's attitudes. If people don't feel supportive of sustainability, feel it's an important thing to leave a better, at least as good a planet as we have, if not a better one for our children and grandchildren and great grandchildren, well, maybe attitudes can be changed through explaining the situation. Maybe that involves education and improving awareness of what happens if we achieve sustainability or move towards it versus if we don't and what some of the harms will be if we don't. Uh, 
laws in the middle here? Do we need laws to help us achieve sustainability? Some countries are instituting laws to make sure that the motion is towards a, a sustainable direction. Lifestyle and living standards. Uh, if we do things, one way to achieve sustainability might be to go back the way we lived in pioneering days, 100, 200 years ago, 1,000 years ago. Well, that's going to be a pretty hard sell. People like what they have. They like moving forward. Giving up on uh, living standards and lifestyles is probably pushing water uphill. It's not going to happen with your hands. Um, rather, we have to accept that people like want better living standards and lifestyles. We have to accept that as part of sustainability. Pushing against that won't be sustainable so socially for sure. Uh, health, incredibly important to make sure we always are healthy situations that everything we do doesn't affect health. The, the global pandemic we're going through right now, I think emphasizes that. Uh, cultures, cultures have to be allowed to evolve and develop. Uh, try instituting engineering solutions or options that go against the grain of culture or the cultural development of an area and you get a lot of social pushback, probably not able to pass things that you hopefully hoped would have been passed and come into being. Ethics, a lot of ethics questions come up with um, sustainability. Uh, is it fair, for instance, that the industrialized, highly developed world is responsible for uh, the majority of greenhouse gas emissions, yet is asking the poorer part of the world to not go through a fossil fuel era and instead to move to a greenhouse gas free type of future, even though the wealthy countries became wealthy using fossil fuels virtually indiscriminately. How do we deal with ethical quandaries like that? And many other issues come into play. So. Uh, there's more than just the pure technical to achieving engineering sustainability. We have to look at many other factors. Let me now move on to some engineering sustainability examples. Give me one second. One would be resource and energy focused building design. Uh, I bring that up in the context, and I show a picture here for context of my university, the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. This is a new university. We came into play 2003. We opened our doors. We were getting, I came on board in 2002. It now looks, part of it looks like this. Um, but being new, we had the advantage of being able to say, let's make this more sustainable than we might otherwise. So we look to make sure that the building was sustainable in terms of resource use and in energy use. Uh, resources, there's gray water collection, for instance, on rooftops to allow us to avoid uh, using nice, clean, treated fresh water in areas like toilets and etc. We also have green spaces. We have a, an environmental watershed beside us that's protected. We put in a lot of energy efficient technologies like high efficiency windows. We put under this green space here, the quadrangle, the main quadrangle, a huge energy storage facility that I'll show you in a moment. So we had the advantage of being new and saying, let's try to implement as many resource and energy sustainable features as we can in a new campus. Now, I'll, I'll segue for a minute, or I'll, I'll step aside for a minute and say, we were lucky. We were really lucky. Why were we lucky? We were a new institution. In 2002, when we're building a lot of the campus, before students are on board and before faculty are on board, I was the founding dean, so I was on board for engineering. Um, we could look at the long term and say, let's put in energy efficient technologies. They cost more upfront, but they pay for themselves over time. And this is a university, we'll be here over time. So if we have to put in a, a technology that's more expensive to save money overall, it makes sense. That's really hard to do once faculty and students arrive. Then it's a short-term perspective. This faculty say, look, we need money in the classroom now. We need money for research now. Students say, hey, I'm going to graduate in four years. I hope uh, 
I'm more interested in having a better learning experience now. Don't do long-term things. Make sure that I have the supports I need at the present. But at the beginning, before we had those people on board, we were able to look to a long-term and try to make the campus somewhat sustainable. You can carry that forward beyond, of course, a university and make sure that you design with resource and energy sustainability in mind. Now, I mentioned under the quadrangle is a large energy storage facility. Let me show you that. Can't take you underground, so I'll take you diagrammatically underground. Here is, these are the two buildings we were looking at, our science building and our business building. Here's the green quadrangle, and this is going down what we see if you were to take an X-ray vision device and look underground. This is um, UIT, University of Ontario Institute of Technologies, BTES, Borehole Thermal Energy Storage System. And it's hooked up to a GSHP ground source heat pump system. So what we have here are 400 tubes, 20 by 20 in a square plan, going down 200 meters deep into the ground. Depending on the season, if it's winter, uh, we uh, take a cold fluid, we run it into the ground, which has been warmed in the preceding season, and the, the fluid goes down one tube, up the other side of the tube, it collected and eventually goes into heat pumps that heat it up. The energy stored in the ground is collected first, and the heat pumps need to do less work to provide the rest of the heating for the building. In summer, we extract heat as we cool the buildings. That extracted heat is sent down through tubes into the ground, warms up the rock mass around the tubes. The tubes are separated by about six meters each and warms up the surrounding rock mass so that that heat can be collected in the next season. We can also store cold. We can break this into quadrants and store cold in one quadrant heat in the other simultaneously to take advantage of mid-season heating and cooling needs that go on um, at, at certain times where you have both demands at the same time. Okay, the result of this is it's expensive to put in, but it pays for itself in about six years. It saves about a million dollars per year in uh, utility bills for the university. So in the long term, it's a smart thing to do. Uh, but so for the first six years, it's as if all the, well, all the savings go into paying off the initial cost. But for the next the lifetime of this might be 20 to 30 years. For the next 15, 20, 30 years, you save about a million dollars per year. Net benefit for sure. So there are many technologies like this, they, and, and it's a hallmark is that they tend to cost more upfront, but they save down the road. Um, it's a hard decision often to make for a, a owner of a home. They may not take the time, may not be willing to wait for the initial investment to pay off. They may move in the meantime, so why bother making an initial investment? But it is wiser in the long term and for facilities that are around for the long term, for sure, it makes sense. There are some environmental impacts. I did an interesting project for the province of Ontario that said, OK, we like those types of ground energy systems. Wonderful. But we have a question, a concern. Some biologists are raising concerns and ecologists as well. They're saying, if I go backwards, this system stores heat. The heat eventually, some of the heat escapes from these tube areas into the rock here and just kind of flows away. Might that affect ecosystems? Near the surface, they find that a one degree change in the environment temperature actually affects the reproduction rate of all sorts of species, uh, micro, micro species as well as, as larger species. So going forward again, here's a picture of our university in the early days during construction. The Boral Thermal Energy Storage System is in the quadrangle there. But here you'll notice we have a river ecosystem. And so the ministry was saying, for example, in your area, this is a maybe a 50 meters away. Could some of the residual heat get into this area and cause disruption to the biological systems in their development? Biologists say it will if the temperature rise is big enough. 
So we did studies. We showed that no, the, the, the temperature rise is contained to about 10 meters away from the system. Once you get beyond that, it's infinitesimal. You wouldn't notice anything here. But this was important to the Ministry of Environment as part of the approvals process for this type of technology. Another example for um, building sustainability is a push nowadays for something called net zero energy buildings. You might hear about that. These are buildings that use net zero energy, zero energy net over the entire annual cycle for a year. There are times when these buildings use energy, but other times they will produce energy and export it maybe to the electrical grid. The net over the year balances out to zero. Now, this is important because in all countries, virtually all countries, national energy use is made up of about a third, 30 to 40 percent, it's higher in some countries, building energy use. So if you can bring building energy use to zero, that avoids a third to 40 percent of most nations' energy use. It allows it to be offset. Now, the type of facilities that might do that, this is an example of a bunch of technologies that can help towards not net zero energy buildings without necessarily um, saying that all of these technologies would show up in the same building. So it's more illustrative. You can have solar collectors on the roof, photovoltaic collectors that allow you to produce electricity. The electricity can go into a smart meter. When you don't need it, you can export it to the grid. You might have a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle that uses that electricity too that you can supply. You can use the electricity internally, like for lighting shown here or for appliances. Um, in addition, these solar collectors can be PVT, T for thermal, they can collect heat because to keep these operating at high efficiency, we need to keep the temperature at a reasonable range. And that means cooling them. Instead of just cooling and throwing away the heat, you can bring it into the facility as hot air and use it for heating air or for domestic hot water heating down here if the temperature is high enough. As well, um, there are passive devices like motorized blinds that automatically shut during the summer to stop sunlight from streaming in, open up uh, during the winter to allow the heat to come in. You can have thermal energy storage, TES, active or passive. Uh, trome walls, for instance, that the heat in winter from the sun striking them, they warm up. The heat is released all night long to provide a bit of a heating. As well, you can have ground energy systems like ground source heat pumps that extract heat from the ground, kind of like the system I showed you for my university. And that heat can be boosted in temperature using a heat pump like it is in my university to provide more air, con air heating and air conditioning for cooling in the summer, as well as domestic hot water. Okay, a massive construct, you may not see all of these in one. The idea though is that you, by doing this, can bring energy use of buildings to net zero. Uh, you can even make buildings net positive. You can, if you size things appropriately, you can actually have buildings that now, instead of being a user of national energy, can actually be a contributor. They, they provide all their own needs and they contribute some energy to the energy system, some surplus. Uh, staying with the energy theme for a minute, uh, an example in Canada that's interest. Oh, and I'm uh, sorry, I didn't mention on the last one, we have a major project on net zero energy buildings at my university and 15 others in, on, in Canada are involved with. Uh, Community energy systems are shown in this diagram, community integrated energy systems. This is interesting. This was done in Alberta, Canada. It's called the Drake Landing Sol Solar Community. I've done some studies on it, although others were involved in the construct of it. This, build, this facility is part of a large development of maybe a thousand homes. Uh, 50 of these were made to be a special type. They have separate garages with solar collectors on the roofs. These are three of the homes shown here. There are 52 in total. Uh, small solar collectors for domestic hot water here. The rooftop uh, solar collectors are used to heat, uh, to provide heat for air heating. 
there's a district energy grid that collects the heat from all 52 of these, transport it to two water tanks for short-term energy storage. If the heat is needed at that moment, it carries on through piping to each of the homes for heating. If not, it goes down into the ground in an underground borehole thermal energy storage system, kind of like the one I talked about for my university. It can be stored there for months until it's needed. Uh, this is just for heating, so it gets hottest in the center and it's colder towards the fringe per peripheral area of the storage. And the idea here is that this was to be a solar heated community. Let me show you a picture of what you see here. There are the houses that I mentioned. I showed three of them. There are the small solar collectors for domestic hot water. Here are the separate garages with the solar collectors on top, collecting heat for space heating. Uh, this is in Okotoks, Alberta, which is near Calgary. Calgary held the Olympics, uh, the Winter Olympics in 1988, so it might be familiar to some. It's also right by the Canadian Rocky Mountains that you see in the distance here, but more importantly, it's in Alberta. Alberta is Canada's fossil fuel province. Most of Canada's fossil fuels are in the province of Alberta. So it's interesting that this was applied in Alberta where access to fossil fuels is quite easy. Uh, 52 homes, 90% solar fraction is what they were designed for. 100% didn't make sense economically. 90% seemed to be the sweet spot. The designers want to expand this from 52 homes to a development of about 1,000 homes because they say the economy of scale will allow to bring the cost down. This was done in the same community. So people living here socially were compared through surveys to people living in other homes to make sure that they didn't find the homes uncomfortable or problematic in any way. And the surveys showed, yeah, no, people didn't notice a difference. The homes were more expensive. The government kicked in to keep the costs the same because this was a demonstration project, but the designers hope to bring the cost down, as I said, by going to larger communities in the long run. And a broader example might be sustainable cities. Um, this is a diagram from a, fossil, uh, from a fuel cell company, but achieving sustainable cities, so st cities that are designed with industrial areas and commercial areas off to one area, separate from residential, uh, transport corridors that in the urban environment avoid fossil fuels. So we'd use electric vehicles or hydrogen vehicles only. Hydrogen emissions are just H2O, electric emissions are just waste heat. You could have refueling stations for both hydrogen and for um, electricity. Uh, homes would be cleaner. They could have their own energy collection like solar collectors shown here. The main centralized facilities for energy would be outside the city, but re renewable like wind and solar farms. And we'd be able to make cities much more sustainable is the viewpoint there. So I'm coming to the close of my talk. Uh, two slides to do that. First, I'll mention that sustainability I consider essential. It's a vital uh, consideration for humanity and civilization going forward. If we want humanity and civilizations to le be left and to thrive 10 years, 100 years, thousands of years into the future. And to do that, engineering sustainability is important. It's a complex quest, but it's a crucial quest to achieve overall sustainability. Engineers provide a lot for, for society and doing so in a sustainable manner is important. And my final slide, I'll remind you that the United Nations passed in 2015, the Sustainable Development Goals for the period 2015 to 2030. There are 17 of them shown uh, by the United Nations through this graphic that you may have seen before. And I want to emphasize that engineering sustainability fits into many of these goals. Um, the goals, no poverty, no hunger, well, engineering is used to uh, in food production, to advance food production, provide crops that are withstanding of adverse environmental conditions better, for instance. Uh, good health, a lot of engineering and health, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, engineering is central to that. Renewable energy, engineering is central to providing that. Uh, good jobs and economic growth, engineering helps there quite a bit. Innovation and infrastructure, engineering 
infrastructure is is hugely important. I jump ahead. Um, sustainable cities and communities will need a lot of engineering work. Responsible consumption of resources. Engineering is responsible for a lot of that, so it has to be more responsible. Uh, climate action, as well as life below water and life on land. So that's really atmosphere, water, and land pollution. Engineering will have a role to play there. So I think that emphasizes how important engineering sustainability will be towards achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals, as well as sustainability for society in general. And with that, I come to the end of my talk. I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions if there's time for any. <laughs>